Hi, everyone. My name is Jason Swartz. I'm a respiratory therapist working out of Canada, Quebec. So for this uh, presentation, we're going to look at the Palma Vista 500 and how it can help guide APRV. Also, we're going to look at time-controlled adaptive ventilation, which is a very specific way in using APRV. We're going to look at the Palma Vista, what exactly it is, how it can guide and manage mechanical ventilation. But for this presentation specifically, we're going to look at how it guides APRV. I have a YouTube channel called Palma Vista 500 Guided APRV, where I film good examples in the ICU case studies so that people can learn APRV as well as seeing the Palma Vista 500 in action. So if you're interested in APRV or both Palma Vista, I encourage you to come and see the case studies on my uh, YouTube channel. So for this presentation, we're going to look at the Palma Vista 500, how it guides APRV. And when we look at APRV, there's a very specific way of using APRV that we're going to go through called time-controlled adaptive ventilation. In some of the scientific publications, they call TCAV personalized APRV and the traditional way as fixed APRV. We're going to call it time-controlled adaptive ventilation for this presentation. So when we look at airway pressure, the release ventilation, there's two aspects to this mode. There's the airway pressure, which is a CPAP phase that aids in recruitment of the alveoli. This helps oxygenation. The CPAP phase is controlled by a setting called pressure high and time high. We're going to call this P high and T high during the presentation. There's also the release ventilation aspect which is a brief release from the P-high setting to facilitate CO2 removal. And this is a brief release from the P-high setting. So this helps prevent derecruitment. The P-low, the pressure low, as well as the time low are the aspects that we control when we're looking at the release ventilation. So the pressure low and time low, I'll refer to that as P-low and T-low. So the appropriate definition of APRV is that it's a continuous positive airway pressure with brief releases to a lower pressure level to facilitate CO2 removal. If you consider that it has been shown that 10% of all admitted ICU patients develop an acute respiratory distress syndrome, ARDS, and their mortality is, depending on the severity, between 35 and 45%, then I'm really worried. This shows that everything necessary to prevent ARDS should be done. Since it is difficult to reduce the mortality of established ARDS, it is important to shift from treatment to prevention. Wouldn't it be good if there is something like a recipe that counteracts the development of ARDS? It's recruitment of the lung, specifically of dependent compartments, while recruitment is affected by time and pressure, the elevated mean airway pressure contributes to the recruitment of slow recruitable compartments of the lung. Well, it's not just one single aspect. There are more ingredients. Alveoli must be kept open and prevented from overdistension and collapse. It is important to prevent stress and strain caused by atelectasis and overdistension which means carefully ventilating the healthy compartments of the lung while preventing collapse of alveoli. Ventilation therapy should ideally support spontaneous breathing. But how should this be done altogether? APRV, this is short for Airway Pressure Release Ventilation. This has been described first by Downs. It implies ventilation on two different CPAP levels and supports unrestricted spontaneous breathing at both levels. But is that really safe? Well, it stabilizes alveoli ventilation and prevents further development of edema. APRV facilitates spontaneous breathing by delivering continuous positive airway pressure and augments ventilation with brief pressure releases to support CO2 removal. So when we're looking at APRV settings, there's four unique settings. Again, the P-high, the T-high, and then the P-low and T-low. 
So the P high is a high CPAP phase. And the time high, the T high, is the time spent at that P high slash CPAP phase. The pressure low is the lower pressure measured during the release. And the T low is the time spent releasing the P high. Notice over here, it is not a setting. We said lower pressure is measured. Now, this is a very unique aspect that we're going to look in, but just keep in mind that I said that the P low is measured and not set which makes time-controlled adaptive ventilation very unique. The time spent releasing the BHI, we're going to look at how we decide to set the T-low. And just briefly, the T-low is dependent on the patient's peak expiratory flow. So we look at the peak expiratory flow, and we want to trap 75% of the peak expiratory flow. This creates an intrinsic PEEP. So basically, we're purposely auto-trapping. And that's why we don't set the P-low, we measure it. So we're actually putting the P-low setting on the vent at zero. This is what APRV looks like. So we have the P-high, and here we see that uh, it's set at 25. So that's the P-I setting. It tells you what CPAP level that you're going to put. Then you have the T-high that's telling you, okay, how long am I going to stay at that CPAP phase? So here we have the 25 set P high, and then we have a setting of T high that determines how long that we're uh, going to hold it. If we set it, let's say this is seven seconds. After seven seconds, there is a brief release that occurs over here. Notice that the expiratory flow on these releases does not reach zero. If we did this and it went to zero, well, the P low would be zero but we're actually stopping the expiratory flow and returning to a P-high level. Also, we see these spontaneous breaths during the CPAP level. There's no trigger on this mode. It's truly a CPAP level. So you have unrestricted breathing all along the CPAP phase. It's also more physiologically similar to how you truly breathe. In a pressure support breath, when we call pressure support a spontaneous mode because there's no rate, you're still triggering a vent and you're getting a pressure breath that is flow cycled, correct? So you're actually inflating the lung with positive pressure. This is not physiological. If we're allowing the patient to breathe spontaneously on the CPAP level, they're using the diaphragm and they're just pulling in air on that CPAP level. This helps diaphragmatic function. It creates a more noisy breathing pattern, which will keep the diaphragm from becoming weak. So which one is APRV? You could basically set up quite different breath profiles. Now we look at the definition. It's a CPAP phase with brief releases. This is how we should think of setting up APRV. We see that the flow never reaches zero. And this is with a P-low set at zero. We've calculated the peak expiratory flow and we've multiplied that by 0.75. And we're gonna stop that breath when the flow descends to 75% of the peak expiratory flow. This is a creation of air trapping. In this one, we almost see a one-to-one -one ratio between your T-high and your T-low. You see that there is a P-low setting here because we see that the pressure is maintained at around 10. So the PLO is set at 10 and we see that the expiration does reach zero. So over the years, because it's been invented since 1987, we've seen that there's in studies quite a lot of variation. So these studies call it APRV, but there's all sorts of breath profiles. And this makes it hard to truly see scientifically because there was no way of using APRV where all the people that are doing these studies are using it the same way. But with time-controlled adaptive ventilation, we're able in the future to use APRV with this way of time-controlled ventilation, the TCAV method. And this is exciting and there will be research down the road coming out. The P-high, so if people have difficulties settings, like where do we set that P-high level? A good way of doing it, especially if the patient just got intubated and you're planning on going to APRV, set it up on ACVC, 
do the lung protective strategy, six to eight cc's per kilogram, titrate your PEEP to get the lowest drive pressure, keep those plateaus under 30. And once you set that up and you do the plateau, the plateau is a good starting point, a good surrogate to start with the P high. In your mind, you're setting this P high, which is a CPAP phase. You want to put this in the most compliant area on the pressure volume loop. If you're setting your P high too low, you're going to have increased work of breathing. You have a suboptimal pressure level. You'll often see that CPAP level become degraded as the patient's pulling in flow and it's not enough. If you overdo your P high, then you're approaching total lung capacity. The breaths will be very shallow. They have no inspiratory capacity because you're reaching too high. Initially, people are just not sure where to set it. So plateau is a good place. You want to set it just enough to recruit optimally your functional residual capacity. So you want to set that P high to recover this area, the functional residual capacity, about 2.5 liters on average you want to have end expiratory lung volume in there. But you want to be right here where the patient has the inspiratory capacity because you're not too high to also have spontaneous breathing. Another way of looking at it with this, you know, you don't want to be too high with your P high. So the P high is how you improve oxygenation. This is a open lung concept where you splint the lung open and you try these brief releases as fast as possible so that there's the least amount of movement in the lung. This will create alveolar recruitment. This creates the optimal compliance and optimal FRC while you're encouraging the patient to breathe spontaneously. As mentioned before, you're actually setting this p -low at zero. This is because the correct setting of your t -low will create an intrinsic PEEP which is your measured P low. So setting the P low, if you set it 5, 10, when you set the P low, this causes resistance to expiration. We all know that there's flow resistance when it goes through an exhalation valve and positive end expiratory pressure devices. So we purposely reduce the expiratory valve to cause that back pressure to create PEEP. The issue is that if you're activating your P low, these releases are super brief. You want the best gradient. So it's important to release that P high to ambient air. This creates the largest gradient and it does not restrict the flow. So you have very rapid release and then you're back up to your P high level. If you're setting the P low, you have to squeeze through that expiratory valve. You're going to lower your tidal volumes. You're going to have trouble with your minute ventilation. Then you're going to say when you use APRV, often the CO2 level gets higher. You have to allow permissive hypercapnia. This was an issue with the original way of actually setting the P low. With the P low set at zero, we're able to get an unrestricted flow during exhalation. So here is an example. We have the P low set at zero. Okay. We've trapped 75% of the peak expiratory flow. We see the flow over here. It doesn't go to zero. Then we do an expiratory pause. The expiratory pause is measured at 15.8. Even though we have zero, because we're trapping 75%, it's not really going to zero. It's actually going to 15.6 as a PLO. Also, don't freeze it and then start measuring these areas when you put the PLO at zero. This is just the circuit pressure that it reduces over here. The PLO, if you set, let's say 10, you're like, I, I don't believe this method. I'm kind of nervous about that. So I'm not going to listen. I'm just going to put a PLO. What happens is you're trapping the 75% of peak expiratory flow, but you're also now engaging a lot of resistance to exhalation. So what ends up happening is it's not really 75%. And it usually will bump up your PLO, and this will create a drastic decrease in tidal volume compared to having it at zero. So don't engage it. We're doing 75%. We see that the flow on expiration does not reach zero. So here is exactly what I'm trying to say. So you have the P high setting, you have those brief releases, and then we bounce back up. The lung, when we see the ventilator pressure, the lung follows slowly behind, and then as it's optimally recruited, 
there's a brief release, but it doesn't snap shut down to this level. There's a slow release of the lung. And before it gets to zero, we're trapping 75% and then we're back up. So this is actually inside the lung where your P low is. And that's why you need to do an expiratory pause, close the expiratory valve. And then after it'll bump up like a plateau and then you measure that, that's your P low. So don't worry. We are not allowing a complete exhalation to a zero. We're not allowing that flow to go to zero. We're looking at the peak expiratory flow. We're multiplying that by 75. We're seeing, let's say if it's hundred, then we're looking at a 75 liters per minute. And then we're looking at the difference in time between that and the 75. That time difference is your T low. That's how you set the T low so that you're trapping 75%. This is just another way of looking at it. So this is the alveoli. This is in pig models. And we're trapping 75% of the peak expiratory flow. We see a very well recruited alveolar surface area on expiration when we're trapping that 75. Again, I'm getting quite repetitive about this, but this is like kind of the concept that sometimes confuses people. Peak expiratory flow, you freeze that waveform, you look at it. It's 100 liters per minute. You multiply 100 by 0.75, that's 75 liters per minute. So you look at the timestamp over here with the peak flow and the timestamp with 75% of the peak flow, that difference is your T low. This allows you to put the P low at zero. And this you see visually that even though the P low is set at zero, you're not going down to zero. In fact, you're stopping it here and then returning to a P high level. Here is the difference between inspiration up here and expiration. So we see at 75%, there's hardly no difference. These brief releases don't de-recruit what we recruited here on the P-high. But if we start lowering the expiratory termination, let's say to 50, we're already getting some atelectasis. And then 25, it just worsens. And then 10, well, it's horrible. So the 75% is the gold standard. That's what you want to trap. That'll create your optimal P low, kind of the version of PEEP. Here again, we're repeating ourselves. The T low is set to terminate at 75% of peak expiratory flow. So you freeze the waveform, you find that peak expiratory flow, you mark the time, you multiply it by 75, you look at that timestamp, then you do the difference between the 75% timestamp and the peak expiratory flow. That's your T low. This is basically exactly what I repeated. We just use the 100 liters per minute because it's just easier to do the math. So see peak flow, 75%. Then you find it. Here's your difference here. That's your T low. So the T high, when we're looking at the time high, this again is the amount of time on the P high level. The T high creates in a way the mandatory respiratory rates on APRV. We consider these brief releases as respiratory rates. This is where the mode will stay on the CPAP level and release to help facilitate CO2 removal. It also determines how many releases occur in a minute. The normal setting for a T high is around four to six seconds of CPAP phase if your patient is breathing spontaneous. If the patient is not breathing spontaneous, maybe a lower setting, two to four seconds. And you're going to look at the minute ventilation based on the patient not breathing and based on these releases. And you're going to get a minute ventilation value. And you're going to start with the minute ventilation that you would be comfortable on conventional ventilation. Here's an example. If you have your T high at 5.5, here's your T low trapping 75%. This whole total cycle time is six seconds. So you're automatically creating about 10 releases. So you can only fit six releases, 60 divided by six. So this gives a mandatory rate of 10. If the patient is acidotic, then you're going to lower that T high level at 3.5. You're not going to change your T low if it's correctly placed at 75%. And this gives a total cycle time of four seconds. So you can fit more releases in to 60 seconds. So this is the way that we can increase the mandatory rate if your patient's acidotic and not breathing. So just remember, when your T high is short, you're making more mandatory rates, you're increasing the mandatory rates. 
You're increasing those releases, which is often called in lectures about APRV bulk ventilation. It starts resembling actually more ACPC without a trigger, creates that kind of breath profile. And we might have to go shorter on your T high if the patient's apneic. Just realize when we're doing more and more releases, we're dropping the P low, you will reduce mean airway pressure. Now these longer T highs, it creates less releases, so you lower the mandatory rate. It does encourage the CPAP phase. And during the CPAP phase, even if the patient's not breathing, you're maximizing the diffusion potential of the lung. While you're inflated and the patient's not breathing, CO2 is entering the alveoli, O2 is still diffusing across. So those releases are a lot more concentrated in CO2. The longer T high phase, this extension of the CPAP phase encourages spontaneous breathing. And it also maintains higher mean pressure because we're releasing less. Here, we're going to see a quick video by Gary Neiman in one of his lectures. And this is the use of time to recruit collateral ventilation. Here is all de-recruited alveoli on this rat model. And we're going to compare one second that we often, let's say, see that's kind of the maximum inspiratory time that we can get with conventional ventilation. And we're going to look at five seconds. We have to remember that recruitment is not only about pressure. It's pressure over time and conventional ventilation. We're limited with time. That's why they created recruitment maneuvers, because we know that sometimes we need more time and we extend that. We hope that we recruit, and then we hope that we put the correct peak to keep that. Here's one second, didn't do much to recruit, right? Here, we're going to see five seconds on it. So you can imagine a T high of five seconds compared to an inspiratory time. We're going to see that right now. Here's five seconds. So in five seconds, we're able to say to recruit this much. And then after, let's say the T high set at five seconds, we have a brief release. We have a brief release, so we're not losing this area. And then the other five seconds may recruit additional alveoli. That's what's really interesting. This is really what is unique and impressive with APRV is that we have control of pressure and we have control of time, which is the exact definition of a recruitment maneuver. Here we see over three seconds. 13 seconds, and then 40 seconds. So we do need sometimes more time to recruit slow recruiting lung compartments. First, let's go back and, and see what do L, would normal alveolar uh, mechanics look like. Uh, and in my laboratory, we have a microscope and uh, it, comes, it can come down on the alveolar surface. And what you're seeing is a rat, uh, normal rat lung and all of the individual the balls here are, are individual alveoli and they're being ventilated. And you can see in the two dimensions uh, that we can see with our microscope, there's very little change in the alveolar size with tidal ventilation, about 2%. So the point being normal alveoli are totally inflated. There's no areas of instability or collapse and they change volume very little with ventilation. And we modeled this with hexagons and with our hexagon model, this is a 2% change in each breath. So keep this in mind, this is what the normal alveoli should look like. Uh, so what happens in ARDS when these alveoli, their surfactant deactivation edema, and these alveoli become unstable? Uh, what does that look like? Uh, here we have a rat lung. You can see on the left is the apical lobe and on the right the diaphragmatic lobe. You can see a line of demarcation and you can see the lungs obviously being ventilated. The lobes are moving. And notice that you see an alveolar duct and alveoli collapse on the duct. And with every breath, these alveoli pop open and collapse back. And this is uh, that Marcelo Amato said, this was like taking a paper clip and bending it back and forth a couple dozen times, it's gonna break. So the uh, very delicate tissues on the alveolar walls are not designed to pop open and collapse like this. And if this goes on for very long, you're gonna have a severely injured lung. And we modeled this. 
by collapsing these alveoli in the center. And again, the alveoli in the center are going to be damaged by this paperclip effect being bent back and forth. But since all alveoli are interconnected, notice what happens to the alveoli surrounding it. They're being overdistended and increased dynamic strain with every breath. And if this goes on long enough, these alveoli are also going to be damaged. So this alveolar recruitment, derecruitment is also acting as a stress multiplier and in injuring the tissue surrounding it. So what are the other stress multipliers other than recruitment, derecruitment? So what he's basically saying is that if you have collapsed areas, these alveoli, when we expire, actually over distend and strain the neighboring adjacent alveoli. So you're actually getting over distension on atelectasis, okay, on expiration. So atelectotrauma actually causes also over distension by straining and pulling the healthy adjacent alveoli, which is quite interesting. That was Gary Neven, the uh, previous one, and this one is a small clip from a lecture made by Dr. Nadir Habashi. He's the one that developed the method of time-controlled adaptive ventilation. Uh, are a honeycomb structure. But probably the most important thing is what's called alveolar interdependence. And you can see this interdependence is that they share alveolar walls. And the lung is reasonably stable and very resistant to deflation and inflation extremes because the forces are equilibrated over this whole area. But unfortunately, if we create an instability in, in this structure, it's going to have a ripple effect on this whole area. And this is again what Gary showed you, but it's really important to stress this. And I want to highlight something else, which is that, and, and these are taken from sort of biological models, just easier to see when you're looking at this. The degree of stretch worsens during the expiration. You know, we all think that inspiration is the is the time that you're going to over descend that baby lung. But as Gary pointed out, what we're probably dealing with is not a, a uh, half the lung is a baby lung and the other half is a diseased lung. And what we're seeing is islands of areas of instability that branch out and then create an effect on their neighbors. And I think that's important. And actually, several other investigators have shown that these stress concentrators are not located in just one part of the lung. Again, this is Dr. Habashi talking about this increased strain and this over distension on expiration. So atelectotrauma is a disaster. You have the cyclical opening and closing. You also have obviously less surface area. So each alveoli have to take charge of more tidal volume. So you're increasing the stress, you're increasing the strain, and you could also over distend on inspiration. So when Dr. Habashi was showing the interdependence of the alveoli, how neighboring and adjacent alveoli have an important impact on each other. So a well-recruited alveoli is very difficult to over distend. So over distension is, it's protected a lot more. All right, so how does APRV help reduce risk of stress and strain. So the T-high uses time to recruit slow recruitable lung compartments. We can think of the dependent lung regions, the dorsal region, but throughout the whole lung, you have to realize that there's varying time constants. We have the luxury with APRV of extending time. And the T-high uses time to recruit collateral ventilation. Now, the alveoli have connecting channels. You have the Lambert, the Martin channel, the Poor of Cons. These are communicating channels that often, because of the inspiratory time being very short, are not able to be used. So with the high CPAP phase, what happens is you allow the ducts and the channels that are connecting the alveolar network, you allow from the pendulum effect, you allow the communication and you allow the flow through these channels. And this is what really helps even out and helps the distribution of ventilation.
Optimal recruitment, it distributes evenly the stress between the alveoli. So if you're looking at significant de-recruitment in areas, we have to realize that even if we're using the six to eight cc's for protective lung ventilation, there's a big difference between six to eight cc's when all the alveoli are doing their job. But six to eight cc's can actually be still harmful because we're not taking account the alveolar tidal volumes. So due to the alveolar interdependent, adjacent alveoli, they splint each other, and this reduced the risk of strain, what we just saw in the video, this over distension on expiration. So we have to keep in mind, mechanical ventilation, it's always gonna put the lung at risk of injury. It's not a natural way of ventilating patient. APRV is the only mode that is configured in a manner that we can passively diffuse gases on this P high CPAP phase as we increase the T high. Each release, each breath evacuates concentrated CO2. The longer we stretch out that CPAP phase, the longer diffusion is occurring across the alveolar capillary network. So those releases have more bang for your buck. There's a lot more concentrated CO2. This allows a lower respiratory rate, which lowers your minute ventilation and less chest movement. It significantly reduces the risk of injury. If we can do anything, if we can take advantage of the diffusion capacity, optimize it to the maximum, we will move the chest less. And it's during the movement of the chest, the lung, that injuries can occur. So here's an example of stress and strain risks. We had a patient on ACPC. The respiratory rate was 22 breaths per minute. So if you think in one hour, we moved the chest 1,320, in one day, 31,680. And let's say the patient's intubated on ACPC, hypothetically, let's assume it's a week. The chest moved 221,760 times. With APRV, when we switch the patient, we are able to manage the patient with superior blood gases with only a rate of 12 breaths per minute or, or 12 releases. So this after one hour was only 720 movements. You can go down 24 hours, seven days. So at the end of the week, compared to 221,000, we only moved the chest 120,000. This is because we maximized the diffusion capacity. We kept ourselves on that P high level and we released very concentrated amounts of CO2. This equates to 41% less chest movement in this patient when they went from ACPC to APRV. I really highly suggest that you read this article. It was published in 2016. We had Gary Neiman in there, uh, Dr. Nadir Habashi. And this is a 30-year evolution of airway pressure release ventilation. They went from 1987 to current time right now, the present time, and they looked at all of the studies that had APRV. Here's just an abstract. I'm gonna read only the highlighted areas, but I really encourage you guys, go check out this study. When you look over here, one of these studies in 87, look how they set it up, all right? Then there's another study here in 93. It's almost like a one-to-one -one ratio. They're definitely not trapping 75%. Look at this one here, how stretched out, how they extended the T-low, which would probably make the patient breathe at this level. And then it would bounce up for some short reason and then back down. And then after you have 2013, something resembling way more the CPAP phase with brief releases. Looking at the highlighted area, the current understanding for optimal strategy is to minimize ventilator-induced injury. And this is to open the lung and to keep it open. APRV should be ideal for this strategy with the prolonged CPAP phase duration recruiting the lung and then the minimal release durations preventing the lung to collapse. However, APRV is inconsistently defined with significant variations in the settings used in experimental studies as well as in clinical practice. Jumping to the next highlighted area, the results showed that there was a tremendous variation in the settings that were all defined as APRV, particularly the CPAP and the release duration. 
The results showed that there was a tremendous variation in the settings that were all defined as APRV in the studies, particularly CPAP and release phase durations, and the parameter used to guide these settings. Thus, it was impossible to assess the efficacy of a single strategy since almost none of the APRV settings were identical. The results showed, however, that in no study there was a statistically significant worse outcome with APRV, regardless of the traditional way, the fixed APRV or the personalized APRV, the TCAF method, multiple studies demonstrated that the personalized APRV, that is also TCAV method, it stabilizes the alveoli and it reduces the incidence of acute respiratory distress syndrome in clinically relevant animal models, like we just saw earlier, also in trauma patients. Dr. Nadir Habashi works in a trauma unit and he first started APRV because he was in charge of the ECMO program. So he started putting these patients on APRV while they waited for ECMO. And he started realizing that a lot of the patients that were put on APRV didn't even require ECMO. And this is how he delved into APRV and used the labs using pig models and really found out the silver bullet of how to use APRV, time-controlled adaptive ventilation. For people that are not grasping the concept, maybe you're more visual, this is just a, bit, a patient on APRV. It's going to be interesting to see really in real time these spontaneous breaths on the CPAP levels, these brief releases where there's air trapping. I'll warn you ahead of time, this patient's P-high level was probably due to be changed. We have some volumes that reached about 12 mLs per kilogram. We're going to talk about that after the video. And I'm just going to be quiet here and just watch, you know, how it looks like. So here's an example of APRV setup. When you're setting your P-high, a good place to start would be while the patient's freshly intubated and probably under some kind of paralytic is to set up on ACVC, do your protective lung strategy, find the optimal PEEP, and the plateau that you get when you transition to APRV, a P-high that's good for a starting P-high would be where your plateau is. If you're using a vent that has ACPC and the PC control is actually a peak inspiratory pressure, you can use that. So somewhere between plateau on ACBC and peak inspiratory pressure on ACPC is a good place to start. Also, like in this case, once the patient starts breathing spontaneous on the APRV mode, they're breathing on that P-high level, which is a, a high CPAP setting. They can breathe at any time along the CPAP uh, setting. The diffusion capacity of the patient, depending on how well they diffuse gases, a lot of diffusion is occurring at the P-high level as it's stretched over time. And when we get these releases here, 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 a lot more CO2 is removed. So this is how the, the vent mode facilitates CO2 removal. And if the patient is breathing spontaneous on the P-high, you'll also get additional CO2 removal by, you see these spontaneous efforts, you see the additional volume that is being, uh, being uh, inhaled. The T-high setting itself is what's going to determine how many releases that you're going to get in one minute. So a good starting point if your patient is already breathing spontaneously, would be around four to six as a T-high. If your patient is not breathing, and often in the ICU setting, we have some acidosis, some respiratory acidosis, and you have to blow off that CO2 initially, we can easily adjust our amount of releases by lowering the T-high. By lowering the T-high, what you're basically doing is you're spending a lot less time up here and you're getting more releases, relying less on the diffusion capacity and more on bulk ventilation. So you see how it changes? So when the T-high goes down, your 
respiratory rate goes up. And we can ventilate at, at very high minute ventilations. We can go right up to a rate, a rate of 30 releases, even 35. Uh, if we go to 1.5, it's usually about 30 releases. acidotic uh, patients initially. When you get a blood gas, the CO2 is within normal limits. You can start stretching out. If they're apneic, stretch out maybe 0.5 at a time. Next blood gas is good, you keep on going. And then once they start making CO2, uh, when they start making spontaneous breaths, well then after you can stretch this a lot, a lot faster starting around four to six. And when they're breathing uh, comfortably on four to six, then you continue stretching out. That will create a much longer stretch, It'll look a lot more like CCOP. It will uh, create a higher mean pressure because we're staying up on that P-high setting a lot more. When you look over here for your P-low, the P-low is set at zero. If we freeze frame that, and we come over here, we see that the measured uh, pressure here is 4.7. So the P low set is zero, zero is not really the amount of air that's in the lung. Also, this is the circuit pressure when there's a release that's measuring circuit pressure. To truly see what your P low is, how much air we've auto trapped purposely, you're going to have to do an expiratory pause. So when it drops down, one moment, sorry about that, patient's coughing a little bit. Okay, so we do an expiratory pause, and then we're going to go over here, and we're going to look, and it's actually 16.8, okay? The reason we're setting this at zero is that we're going to create such a brief release with our T low that we're going to purposely cause air trapping, which you see here. You see it doesn't reach baseline, it doesn't go back to zero, it starts descending and then it goes right back up. So we're removing the resistance during that, the release so that we get the quickest release by putting this at zero, so it's not going through a peak valve. And then we're gonna do a calculation, and this is like the trickiest part, I guess, of uh, the whole thing. We're going to create a PLO by setting a TLO that is determined by 75% of the peak expiratory flow. So what do I mean there? So I'm just gonna stop it because in the video I kind of like take long, but anyways, here we're gonna look at the peak expiratory flow, which is 73 liters per minute. And then we're gonna look at the time step. Then after we're gonna multiply the 73.4 by 0.75, and then after we're gonna see over here that whatever 75% of 73 liters per minute. And then we're just gonna scroll. The most important to understand is peak flow and 75%. Do the math, look at the difference, and that's where you're gonna set your T-low. That's basically what I'm trying to say. So a couple of things. Tidal volumes were large, but if you notice, the patient was making their own tidal volumes. A lot of those 800 mLs was actually on the CPAP phase, so not really worried about that. Some of the releases went up to 12 mLs per kilogram. But we have to realize that we're optimally recruiting, like we're completely recruiting. If we completely recruit the lung on that extended CPAP phase, it's for sure that there's going to be larger tidal volumes, like you totally recruited the alveolar network. So, you know, the six to eight cc's per kilogram that's applied on conventional, it might not, and I don't want to make like an absolute claim, maybe there's more research, but even Dr. Nadir Habashi that uses it noticed that it seems like 12 cc's per kilogram occurs when the lung is optimally recruited. And this actually might not be dangerous when you're using APRV. A fun aspect of the Draeger V500, now that you understand the theory behind the 75%, very simple with the V500, you press auto release. You turn it on and you just put 75% expiratory term. You don't have to do the calculation. It's doing breath per breath, the calculation. But obviously, I wanted to go through it. It's important that you understand like what exactly is happening 
with the 75%. So are we concerned about the occasional tidal volume of 12 mLs per kilogram? So recruitment of the lung compartments with different time constants occur because of APRV's ability to extend the T high. So we have to think of tidal volume delivered to the lung that we often think about the 6 to 8 cc per kilogram versus the actual tidal volume delivered to the alveoli. So if you have more alveolar surface area, this reduces the stress for each individual alveoli. Let's say you're doing the protective lung and you're doing the six to eight cc's per kilogram, but because you can't stretch that time, it might be optimal settings, the safest you, that you can do. It doesn't necessarily mean that you've recruited all of the alveoli because you're limited in your time. So what I'm trying to say is if those alveoli are not taking part in that tidal volume, you're actually doing six to eight cc's, but potentially those alveoli are feeling much larger volumes. Also, we have to look at collateral alveolar ventilation through the connecting channels. So on that high CPAP phase through the Pendeleuf effect, you're actually going to have these Lambert, Martin channel, the pore of cons. You have no flow on that CPAP phase and it can kind of start diffusing across these channels. And this doesn't really happen with the limited time in conventional modes. And also we have to look at the recruited alveoli, they reduce strain, while the collapsed alveoli, they increase strain. So here is Gary Neiman in one of his lectures showing the TCAV method compared to the protective lung ARDS net method. These are PEG lungs. The sepsis is induced, the fluid overload. So they're really trying to create the worst condition for the lung. We see with the TCAV method, there's actually twice the tidal volume from 12 mLs to 6 mLs per kilogram. But often you'll actually see a lower drive pressure. Now, what do I mean by drive pressure in APRV using the TCAV method? It's the difference between the P high and the measured P low. So we often have that 75% release. The gradient, the drive pressure, or the release drive pressure is lower. And here we have the six cc's per kilogram, but the drive pressure actually was a lot higher. We have a pretty pristine lung, which is really kind of impressive with 60 liters positive in fluid. This higher mean pressure was able to overcome all of this increased pleural pressure, maintaining a good transpulmonary pressure likely, and this was not. So what really is occurring inside the lung? Let's say, for example, let's say you start with a P high of 25 and the T high is at four seconds. The initial tidal volume is 375. When you come back in an hour, it's 450. Then it's 580. Then after eight hours, the end of your shift, you're up to 650. Within 16 hours, it seems to have stabilized at 750. What exactly is happening? It's very clear that the reason why you're keeping the pressure and the time constant the only reason why the tidal volume can be increasing is that actually you're increasing the alveolar surface area. So again, when you're using APRV, you're getting a lot of information, you're getting a lot of feedback. Remembering, like I, I keep on repeating, pressure over time. That's the definition of alveolar recruitment. We have to start thinking about time constants that have varying amounts of time to open up and varying pressures. When you look at the traditional modes, again, the inspiratory time is often 0.6, maybe one second. So that time part is limited. In the traditional modes, what happens on inspiration, recruitment happens. And then after we're hoping we set the PEEP correctly to keep the lung open with the PEEP setting, the optimal PEEP. But in APRV, recruitment happens with pressure over time, it happens with the P high and the T high. But APRV also, the derecruitment is different. The derecruitment is prevented when we do that T low set at 75% of expiratory flow. So this is another great study, a publication that I encourage you to read, Acute Lung Injury, How to Stabilize a Broken Lung. What Dr. Nadir Habashi made the example of a broken bone. What do you do when you have a broken bone? You're going to splint it and put a cast and you don't want any movement of that broken bone. If you have a lung 
whether you're trying to prevent it from becoming broken or it's already broken, what you want to do is to splint that lung open to keep it open as long as possible and to create the shortest release and return back. Here is the Palma Vista. We're going to go into detail. The blue is basically the aeration and the white is the maximum ventilation. So it helps us see how even it is. If you had like white, big white blotch somewhere, you know that more of that tidal volume would be going to the white areas. So you want to kind of have an even distribution within the blue area. We don't want big spots because that shows that more tidal volumes going to that area. Those alveoli are dealing with a lot more volume and that's increasing the stress. And if over distension occurs, then you also have a strain. So here's the dynamic image. It holds a bit. There's the release phase back to the CPAP level release phase. So the T high here isn't really that long. It's probably around, let's see, one Mississippi, two Mississippi. It's probably around like two, 2.5. Nice distribution. That increased inspiratory time on the T high allows for that collateral ventilation to happen a little bit. You have better distribution. You have a nice recruitment of the dorsal area, those gravity dependent regions. Here's an example of a patient that had a bowel surgery. It really went wrong. This patient actually had to return, requiring a lot of fluid, a lot of third spacing occurring, giving units, albumin, and patient ends up going into DIC. Here you see that baby lung effect. You can see the flattened diaphragm, probably a significant amount of pleural effusions occurring here. We got the fluffy infiltrates. We got a very small lung. And we had set the patient on ACVC. The tidal volumes were 300. We had a respiratory rate of 28. We only had a minute ventilation of 3.50. Blood gases were around 7.08, 7.10. The PEEP was set at 15. Anything higher just skyrocketed the plateau pressures. Patients on 100%. We got a plateau that's well above the 30 that we're comfortable with. We have a drive pressure that's way above. We're not keeping it under, or we cannot keep it under the 15. And we're only setting 88. So the PF ratio is 72, indicating severe ARDS. We set the patient August 25th on APRV. From 22nd to the 25th, nothing really changed. The lung pretty much looked like this the same parameters, consistently high pleural pressure. So with APRV, immediately we're able to decrease the plateau. We're able to go to 30, so that's great. The P low fell at 15. It's very often the optimal peep when you trap 75%. We had the T high stretched at four. So we're using less pressure and we're also able to stretch out more time the T low is very brief. You'll notice that T lows, as they are smaller and smaller, that's usually an indication of poor compliance. As the compliance improves, you'll notice that your T low actually gets longer. When we did the 30 P high and extended the T high at four, we had a tidal volume of 437 initially. And within five hours, that increased to 550. The minimum ventilation greatly improved, a little less than double. And we were able to get better blood gases. They weren't corrected, but we were definitely able to bump up the pH a tad with a respiratory rate of 14. So from 28 chest movements per minute to 14. And obviously we know that a lot of bad things, stress strains, atelectasis, all sorts of horrible things are happening. So if we can reduce the amount of movement of the chest, we're doing something good. The FiO2 was half. We're now on 50%. The drive pressure is close to a safe region. So we've actually kind of returned to a safe region where the P high, the equivalent plateau is 30. The release is only 15, that release drive pressure, better saturation. So this is August 22nd. Then we have August 26th. We were able to lower the P high a little bit more. The P low was a little bit lower. Tidal volume was good. The movements of the chest was now at 11 with 40%. So that severe ARDS rating with your PF ratio, now we're at 175. I believe that's uh, bringing you into moderate 
ARDS. That's quite impressive. We started with this on ACBC and we were able to get this. How do we wean APRV? Well, we call this a drop and stretch. Just like any mode, as a compliance and the patient's lung improves, you need less and less pressure support. You'll need less drive pressures. You'll need less pressure control, like peak inspiratory pressure settings. So as the compliance, as the lung improves, you drop the pressure. And as the patient improves and they start breathing spontaneous, you stretch the T-high. So this is what we call drop and stretch in the weaning phase. So we drop the P-high, we increase the T-high. This is looking more and more like CPAP. This is really optimizing the diffusion potential of the lung. And depending on your center, people that use APRV, Dr. Nadir Habashi, as well as in our ICU, I'm very comfortable on exfading on a CPAP level of 10 to 12. We can add automated two comp also when we have a CPAP phase, we're in the weaning phase. Personally, I don't automatically put it to 100%. I look at the patient's work of breathing and I'll increase it slowly, not necessarily 100%, but it's fine if some people put it at 100% also. So let's look at Palma Vista 500. What exactly is this Palma Vista 500? Well, it's an electrical impedance tomography that is non invasive. And this technology helps to visualize the distribution of ventilation within the lung. It gives you dynamic images in real time. And this is directly at the patient's bedside. You don't have to transport them anywhere. And there's no radiation. So the electrical impedance tomography, what you basically have is a 16 electrode belt that goes across the chest. It sends low frequency current at 50 Hertz. So it's quite rapid. The currents cross the chest and the electrodes, what they do is they measure the impedance changes inside the lung during the respiratory cycles. So just remember with EIT technology that more volume inside the chest creates more resistance to the signal, more impedance. As we have increased impedance, we have increased volume. When there's decreased impedance, we have decreased volumes. And the tomography takes all of these values and uses these values to create a computerized image of the distribution of ventilation. The electrode is placed between the fourth and sixth intercostal space. You know, intercostal space are hard to find. So it's basically a good place to put it at about two inches below the armpit. This is the normal distribution of ventilation. So when you're looking, we have a, a template here in gray that helps us understand what exactly we're looking at. So this represents the sternum. This represents the vertebrae. So what we're doing is we're looking at a caudal to cranial view. It's the same perspective as a CT scan. It's like you're at the foot of the patient. You're looking through the chest towards the head. So this is the ventral area, the mid ventral and, and mid dorsal area, as well as the dorsal area, the gravity dependent regions. We can say this is the anterior and this is the posterior, but with this machine, they label it as ventral to dorsal. The blue regions, these appear when 10% of the ventilation is being distributed. The white regions inside means that there's a larger amount of that tidal volume being distributed. So it kind of represents the maximum ventilation. And it's a quick visualization where you can see how evenly or homogeneous the distribution is. Again, for the example here, there's a little bit more intensity on the right side here compared to the left. So this is telling me right away, oops, I want to try and smooth out that white because maybe there's a little bit more tidal volume and the alveoli I have to deal with a little more alveolar tidal volume here. If you're under 10%, sometimes you'll see a black area and it's marking three, four to you know 5%. So when you're looking at a black area on the tomography where there's no distribution, it doesn't mean necessarily that there's absolutely zero ventilation but it means that it's minimal, it's under 10%. So I'm gonna use an iceberg as an analogy for what we're dealing with here. So let's say you're the boat, you're coming up here. You're very limited if you wanna describe this iceberg. If you're on the boat, if you're on the surface, you're really only able to analyze, to describe, to measure the summit of this iceberg. 
you don't see anything. You can't describe anything about what's going on under the water. So this is kind of like when we arrive at the ventilator and we have these global measurements like the plateau, the compliance, the drive pressures. These are important values, but you are significantly blind in a way because you don't know where the tidal volume is going. You don't know if it's going all here in the lung and there's like this area not taking part. Unless you take a snapshot in time of a CT scan or try and like get an idea with an x-ray, you're really limited in the information that you know. You have basically no regional measurements. So if you're able to peer under the water, if you're able to use the electrical impedance tomography to see inside the lung and get regional measurements, now you can actually measure end inspiratory lung volumes when you're doing the recruitment maneuvers. You're not just looking at the numbers on the vent and the sat. You're actually seeing regional distribution changes in a dynamic fashion that you can measure. Also, end expiratory lung volume. You're doing changes. You want to know if you're recruiting your functional residual capacity. You can do this with this innovative technology. You can measure regional distribution of ventilation. You can look at percentages in quadrants, in layers, if you want to look at ventral to dorsal. And these changes in regional compliance that we're able at even to do PEEP studies, we can do optimal PEEP studies to set that PEEP in the most compliant area. Here's the main screen. And when you look at the main screen, this is actually a, a snapshot of the screen. There's a dynamic image. This is the previous, the last title image. If you go up here and press reference, there's actually a reference box that you can uh, use here. Next time for the next lecture, I'm going to actually, you know, take one with a whole box here that says reference. So you can compare the dynamic to that reference snapshot that you've taken. Also, if you're connected to a Draeger product, you're also going to get the tidal volumes that are on the vent. You can use this technology on any vent, but if you're not using the Draeger vent, then you're not getting those tidal volumes. Also over here, we see that we've layered it. Remember the ventral to dorsal, the eight to 15% for the dorsal, the mid area is 35 to 40% distributed, and again, eight to 15. So here, this is considered pretty much a normal tomography. We see the regions of interest, ventral, it's 8%. Then in the mid area, it's 41 and 42%. That's normal to have the largest amount of tidal volume in the mid areas. Here you'll see the impedance waveforms. And like I said, impedance, volume, they're interchangeable. So these will resemble the volume waveforms on your vent if you're connected with a Draeger product. Over here, we're looking at the end inspiratory trends. So we're looking at the lung, what happens at the end of inspiration. Over here, we have a PEEP of five. We can see that down over here. So look at the PEEP of five, what's happening. There's dorsal atelectasis here. With the PEEP of five, we're not getting much ventilation over here. It's actually at 3%. And because we're pushing in ventilation, we're pushing in volume, but we are collapsed here. What usually happens is that the mid areas and even sometimes the ventral areas, they have an increased amount of stress and strain. They have to deal with the increased tidal volume because of the reduced surface area. Over here, we increased in an, in, with a, an attempt to recruit the dorsal area and we were successful. So you see here, very poor ventilation, and now we've recovered good ventilation. If you go over here, this is basically a color-coded way of expressing what just happened between the reference and the PEEP of 14. What happened is over here, there's more ventilation now. And that is seen over here as blue. And because we opened up here, then if you look over here, this orange, that's because there's a loss of ventilation in the mid area because it opened up here. So you have basically an opening of the dorsal area and a redistribution to the dorsal area. So it's saying, hey, there's a lot less ventilation up here because now there's room there. So orange doesn't necessarily mean, oh, it's bad. It's an expression of what just happened, where you had a loss in the ventral areas redistribution at the base. Over here, we had 3% and we recovered 
Now, 14 was able to recruit, but it doesn't necessarily mean that we have to stay at 14. We could now try and go lower, and that's basically what we're doing over here. So if you look under here, these again are the impedance values, which are also the tidal volume. So we see here, we start with a peep of five, we ascend up here to a peep of 14, and we mechanically increase the functional residual capacity here. And this over here is 14, and it goes down 12, 10, 8, and 6. When you see that the impedance is holding, we know that 14 is able to hold what we recovered. But 12 is actually pretty good too. It's staying straight. 10, not bad. But look over here, it's like really obvious. The impedance values start going in a downward trajectory. That here means that we're losing FRC, and that's likely going to be this dorsal area. And when you're connected with the Draeger product, it's great because everything's written here. So all the maneuvers, all of the things that you've done on the vent are indicated here. The peep is in green, tidal volumes in pink, purple, and you have the peak inspiratory pressure over here in yellow. You can see the staircase thing with the various peeps. So this here, this button, you can scroll all along the time axis. You can change your reference. You can, you know, maybe compare 10 to 6. So you can navigate all through the maneuvers that you did on the ventilator. If you want to look at the functional residual capacity in greater detail, you can go to the end expiratory lung volume. So what we're doing here is, you remember the impedance equals tidal volume? So these are actually impedance values at the end of expiration. And these impedance values are positive. So you know globally, you've increased the FRC, the end expiratory lung volume, and it shows you ventral, the mid area, and the dorsal. Now, impedance values don't really give me an idea like how much tidal volume. So if you're connected to Draeger, you can look at the global reference that's over here, the 655, and it says it right here. The impedance values multiplied by the tidal volume of the global reference. So what you're basically doing is you're multiplying these impedance values by 655. And when you do that, you're just multiplying. Now you can translate that into milliliters. So you can see a peep of five compared to 14. That's like a lot of tidal volume. But you have to remember that on average, functional residual capacity is about 2.5 liters. Larger men could go up to three liters. So we're recruiting over here at the end of expiration with a PIPA 5 compared to 14, we've gained all of this volume in these regions of interest. This here is color-coded method. Again, these are all positive. That's why it's showing up in blue, but you would have orange if you had any loss. Also, if ever you opened up an area, you could have, let's say, some orange here and some blue there. That's a good thing. It means that you're redistributing. So here, this is just a color-coded method of analyzing visually, as well as getting the tidal volumes for the assessment of your end expiratory lung volume. Over here, remember we we're speaking about the EIT, the electrical impedance tomography's ability to also measure dynamically regional compliance changes. And because of that capacity, that capability, we're actually able to do PEEP studies. And these PEEP studies are very simple. You can do as you want. You can do like up here, incremental increase with a constant drive pressure to try and recruit. Or you could go right to 14. It doesn't matter clinically. You do what you're comfortable with, but the electrical impedance tomography will capture all of those maneuvers. Then it gives you the regional compliance. So over here, we have 14 down to six. These are those tidal images. Remember we mentioned like eight and six, there was that downward trajectory. Look over here, we've literally lost ventilation here. So over here, looking at the orange area, CLHP, compliance loss in the higher peak percentage. So what it's saying is at a peak of 14, that's good. You're recruiting the lung, but you're actually creating 21% more over distension compared to a PIPA 5. When we go down to 12, 
we have 16% of over distension. Then we go to 10, we got 10%. So we see as we go higher, we're getting some over distension. And then when we go lower, we're actually getting a loss of compliance in the dorsal region, which is indicative of over distension. So white means or indicates risk of derecruitment and the orange indicates the risk of over distension. We have to not just rely on this monitor. We have to look at also, you know, not just underneath the iceberg. We have to also incorporate those global measurements. I would be a little less worried about the over distension if I had like a plateau of 20. Even though I know that there's some loss in compliance, plateau of 20, maybe I would push the optimal peak right up to 12 or 11, because I kind of don't like the loss here. But if I'm at higher plateaus, for example, I might take these things more seriously. But in general, if you want to get the least amount of risk of atelectasis and the least amount of risk of over distension, you're going to look at these vectors where these numerical values of compliance loss and over dissension, they're put on vectors basically here. Usually, if you look at where they cross, that would be the optimal peak setting where you get the least amount of over distension and the least risk of atelectasis. But if I have a really obese patient, I'm going to use my clinical judgment and maybe I would tolerate a little bit loss of percentage just to prevent atelectasis. This yellow area here indicates alveolar instability. It's also given as a percentage. So we don't want orange, we don't want white, and you know what? We don't want any cyclical opening and closing indicated by the yellow. So when we're using APRV on the ventilator under diagnostics, we can either do a PEEP trial or we can do a customized analysis. But it's the same kind of principle that we just did with the PEEP study. In this example, I adjusted the P-high from 20 to 30, and I'm looking at the regional compliance loss or gain. So with the customized analysis, it's a little bit different. We don't have white for atelectasis, and we don't have the orange for over distension. Well, actually, we have the orange, but it kind of switched up with the blue. So look, blue is compliance win percentage, 20, 22, 24, 26, 28, all the way up to 30. As we increase the P-high level, we see the blue indicates compliance win. We're getting more and more compliance win, okay? We see compliance loss is orange. We see zero compliance loss. So we know that we're very confident to increase that P-high from 20 to 30. Even if perhaps it's like, ah, I'm getting to decent tidal volumes, the blood gases are good. But with the EIT, we're able to truly manage this patient with the regional information, always keep that optimal. We also look at the impedance values. The black underneath is always your end expiratory lung volume. So you see at 20, 22, 24, eh, nothing's happening. 26 starts to climb up. 28, some more upwards trajectory, meaning an increase in functional residual capacity cuts off here, but then it really starts going upwards or trending upwards with the P-high of 30. So this is how we can use customized analysis for APRV. Here, I just wanted to put a very nice dynamic image. Here we had CT scan. We see the proper aeration over here and over here. Here we see a large and complete consolidation. We know that there's consolidation because if you look over here, we see the air bronchograms. So that is true consolidation. And the issue with consolidation is it's not lung collapse. You're probably not going to open. What's going to happen is if you try and open this area, it's just going to translate all of that vent power to the left side. And this is an example of us trying to open up a little bit and we see all of the white intensity. So we had to back off on the P-high with this one. And the issue here, this is like when you transported your patient to the CT scan, right? This is like one snapshot in time. Look how accurate. You can really superimpose this right on there. So this is extremely accurate technology. And you'll get a CT scan. You'll be like, oh, good. I'm going to check it out. We're kind of focused mostly on looking for derecruitment. But we don't really have to use this if we have the electrical impedance tomography. 
we can visualize this dynamically literally over the whole shift if it's required. So this is a case study. This is one of my favorites. We have an aspiration pneumonia that happened during the anesthetic induction. The anesthesiologist sent me some pictures. I asked him for them so I could add them to the presentation. Here is some of the airway. We see the patient that vomited the aspirate that is inside of the lung. So I was called to the recovery room and the anesthesiologist explained the situation. The patient's on 100%. We're only satting 85 about. And we tried to recruit as much as we could with ACPC, with higher peeps. This caused most of the ventilation to come to this area up here in blue. We weren't really able to open up very much the dorsal area post aspiration. So we see that this area here, the dorsal and mid dorsal area are abnormal. So we tried APRV, we tried to add time instead of just pressure. And we got a little bit more ventilation. You see the white here, we're getting a little bit more distribution to the base, but it's still very uneven. And the ventral areas, the most compliant areas are getting the brunt of the tidal volume. That's not ideal. You can take the risk of doing that. And over time, we could maybe start recruiting and this would look better, you know, maybe tomorrow or in eight hours, but we really wanted to be careful about the ventral areas. So my idea was, well, you know what, why don't we just prone the patient by proning the patient and keeping the electrical impedance tomography on, we're splinting the ventral areas because we have the body weight now and we're removing the pressure of the heart. And my hope was to encourage the dorsal distribution of ventilation. Here is the image within maybe two hours of what we started with patient in the prone position on APRV. And we see a very homogeneous distribution of ventilation, maybe a little bit here in the ventral area, but this proning plus APRV, so pressure, time, and position was able to do a very good job. And this is how we use the Palma Vista 500 to help manage and guide our management of the patients. So just a brief look, ACPC, APRV, and then APRV prone. All guided, no guessing, all the regional information taking into account the global parameters, the global measurements. This really gives us a much more complete view of the lung. This was a short clip I sent to the intensivist. Seriously, it makes our job fun. This is an amazing technology. It makes my job a lot more interesting and exciting. It's something I can offer the team that nobody else as a respiratory therapist, the doctors aren't doing this. So it really makes us feel like a special part of the team. So this was me filming the dynamic image and I sent it to the anesthesiologist. You can see I'm super happy and giddy and enjoying myself. And if you're passionate about your job, you should be happy. You should be having in a way fun with this. When we were in the recovery room, having trouble with the dorsal region, and watch this. Boom. I love my job. It's down to 35%. We got a pre high of 18. And he's setting 94. Over here, we have a post-op abdominal surgery patient's not doing well, distended abdomen. So we know that there's a high amount of pleural pressure. We got to start increasing this pressure to equalize the transpulmonary pressure. You don't want a negative transpulmonary pressure. If this pleural pressure is above 30, you're going to have to have the guts to go to 30 and beyond, or else you're going to have a negative transpulmonary pressure. Here we are getting the regional information and we're going to do a customized analysis and to look at where the over distension is. If we don't have the luxury of having a transesophageal pressure, then we have the electrical impedance tomography that will tell us when we're going beyond when we're losing compliance. So if you have the choice of measurement to measure your transpulmonary pressure, or you have the palma vista, I would choose the palma vista all the time.
Here we do a recruitment maneuver. You see how it starts scaling up. D, E, F, G, I wrote down. So D is 34, E is 32, 30, 28 down to 24. Now you would think usually we're comfortable with 30 and we start getting nervous when we go above. But what we're actually seeing here is as we go from 30, 28 and lower, we're actually losing compliance in these areas. So we have that high distended abdomen that's really putting a lot of pressure on the outside of the lung. And this is reducing the compliance. We really need to increase the pressure. So by using the Palma Vista 500, again, we're guiding the management of what we're doing with this lung with regional information. And in fact, we actually need very high pressures to prevent lung injury. This is uh, yesterday, the 12th. Uh, uh, this is what I was talking about, the uh, distended uh, abdomen and the uh, extremely dilated colon. So we see that this is a patient with the patient's on a supine position. And you can see due to that increased pleural pressure and, and um, a complete uh, elimination of aeration at the dorsal region. So we decided to flip the patient at the end of the shift. And here we are uh, this morning, finally with this result. So very, very good result uh, with the proning. One thing here that I want to show you is, so remember, these are positive impedance values. Impedance means volume. When there is purple over here, in one side, and you see how that purple is kind of like the ventilation is affected in this area. Purple are negative impedance values, and that's when there's a significant accumulation of fluid. So this patient over here has a slight pleural effusion. It can actually even catch pleural effusions, and you can go let the doctor know, well, there's a pleural effusion, it's affecting a bit of the ventilation. So some doctors really like to look at this Palm Vista image and help decide, look, is it affecting ventilation enough that we should put a chest tube? Over here, things have changed. So this is when the patient is in the prone position. I actually had taken off the belt. So when they're in a prone position, the belt's off. You have to put them on backward, actually. So you lift the patient, you slide the belt, and then you actually connect it to the back. So this is actually the reverse. Over here, this is the ventral, and this is the dorsal area. Now we need less pressures. We have 32 down to 26. So A is 32 over here. We tolerate down to 30. But again, when we actually go below 28 and 26, we're starting to have that upward trend of compliance loss on the lower pressure levels. It can be seen over here. So this, again, allows us to know, look, we're going to keep that around 32 or 30. What I usually do when I put the EIT in is before doing anything, I do the global PEEP study, the global mechanics. I look for that optimal PEEP on ACVC and I mark all that down. Then after I do the Palma Vista PEEP study, that's going to show me the regional compliance and tell me where to set that lung where there's the least over distension and the least risk of collapse. And then after I go and measure in APRV that 75%, which as we saw in the first part of the lecture, 75% creates the least amount of change between inspiration and expiration on the size of the alveoli. What I noticed is very often the auto release, if you keep it at 75 with the peep at zero, it actually falls really, really often on the optimal peep. So I did initially eight to 10. Here's the total peeps. Here's the drive pressures. It seems to be jumping up by three. It seems this to jump up about two, the drive pressures. So I would say that there's no benefit to go above eight. If we're just jumping the plateau. I should have done six. I didn't. Maybe six would have been optimal. But on the Palma Vista peep study, I did do six to 10. And if you look here, six has minimal, what, 1% atelectasis or 1% risk. 
or basically 1% loss of compliance. Here you have 2% loss of compliance with the rest, there's no percentage of loss of compliance. But when you jump up to 10 here or nine in between, you see that you're starting to lose compliance and it makes a lot of sense over here, right? And then after I took eight, which had a total peep of nine and the plateau, I transitioned over here with a P high. I did the expiratory pause, P low of zero, the 75% and look, 8.9. So what's really good about a PRV when you set it at 25, you're able to get very close to the optimal peep usually. And we used a PRV actually for COVID patients because they had such a high respiratory drive, very hard to do mechanics triggering the vent, lots of auto peep. So we actually used APRV with 75% auto release with very low T highs. And this was a way of developing a ACPC, a pressure control profile without having that trigger issue. And we were also able to control the amount of auto peep because we we're trapping consistently 75%. For here, I want you to pay attention to inspiration, expiration, how on inspiration, how small the aeration gets on expiration. And then when we pop into APRV, I want you to notice because we're stretching out more, you're going to notice over here, almost immediately, we start getting recruitment here and we start getting recruitment here. And we're talking about a matter of a couple of seconds. And you can imagine how improved the distribution of ventilation is six hours from now. You have that constant mean pressure. You have the collateral ventilation. So let's just look at the uh, video. This is ACPC. This is the optimal PEEP. So when we look at optimal PEEP, we're not saying that the lung is perfectly aerated. What we're saying is with that mode, that's the best we can get. So we see inspiration and expiration in ACPC. And now we're going to try APRV. And keep an eye on here and here. Watch coming now up here. Look, recruitment occurring in a matter of uh, less than a minute. And then recruitment over here. So again, this is pressure over time. Same pressure as ACPC, but we have time that can stretch out and we get a superior distribution ventilation. Here's another issue. Lots of stuff happening here, but this indicates from the negative impedance value that the purple here is that there's a significant accumulation of fluid, probably a pleural effusion over here, greatly affecting the distribution of ventilation in this area. This is us on ACPC. So look, I noticed though that sometimes you had a little bit of ventilation going here. So I was like, hmm, maybe we can use APRV and just keep that open instead of it bouncing open and closed. So this is APRV. What we did here in an attempt to open up this region is we went with conventional ventilation. Over here, we went from 10 to 20 and then 20 down to 10, all right? The maximum pressures were around 40. You know, we do 40 over 40 recruitment maneuvers. This was an attempt to recruit. This over here is 18, 16, 14, right down to 10. So this is measuring around here to here. But what you're seeing is as you go up from 10, 12, right up to 20, all you're getting is bad stuff. All you're getting is more and more compliance loss. You have this yellow, which indicates lung instability, cyclical opening and closing. You don't want that yellow either. So if we would use ARDS net, you know, the typical protective lung ventilation, if this patient's on an FiO2 of 100 and you look at the PEEP scale that's based on FiO2, imagine trying to increase it to 20, making your lung 52% less compliant. Then after your plateaus are going to be up above 30. And the ARDS net says that if your plateaus are above 30, to actually reduce to five and to four milliliters per kilogram. And you're going blind because you don't have this regional information. And if you really are limited to ARDS net protocol and you don't want to use APRV, then you're going to be stuck with PIPA 10, unable to recruit. And that's my issue with traditional ARDS net. 
it really is a one size fits all. It's not really adapted to the, the individual lung. Here we have APRV. We have this P high that again is able to hold it much longer. And you can see the pleural effusion here that's bobbing up and down is pushing against the fluid in the pleural space. Here's the dynamic image. I'm actually freezing it because I'm taking the screenshots. So over here, we can see when we transition, here's the peep, and then we lose the peep. This is the APRV. We see an upward trajectory when we started over here, increased functional residual capacity. We divided this into quadrants. We're not doing layers because I want to really concentrate on region four, which is the left lower quadrant. This was the issue here, right? And we're able to increase the distribution from 11 to 16. This is occurring almost immediately from 304 to 306. And we see that at the start, this could be problematic because we see the majority of the ventilation is going to the ventral area, even though we're still able to start opening up this region. So we have two choices. Do we keep an eye on it and see within a few hours? Because yeah, maybe it's here. It's kind of trapped more in the ventral and mid-ventral area. But if you give it time over hours, that collateral ventilation, those time constants, that higher mean pressure, we could just by leaving it here, get a distribution of ventilation that's better. Or you could be really safe and you can do like the previous one. You can put them in a prone position, start putting the weight on the more compliant area and get a similar result to the one that we saw previously. Here's just an image comparing APRV to ACPC. Here's another case study. This is a patient on pressure support ventilation. We did a PEEP study, titrating the PEEP right up to 14. As you can see here, the left dorsal region, there's no ventilation. So we did the PEEP incremental PEEP study in, a, in a, an attempt to open up that dorsal region. Sorry for the quality of the image. This is like a picture and it's really kind of a little blurred. But over here, you see the various PEEP. So here we're increasing the PEEP. We do see a upward trajectory. So we are recruiting, but we're not necessarily recruiting in the right area. We might just be increasing end expiratory lung volume to the ventral areas. Here is eight, six. Then I went back to eight. And then you go 10 right up to 14. So you see when we start at 8, 10, 14% loss, and it just keeps on going. The lung remains still quite unstable. There is very, very minimal improvements in compliance. Look at all that yellow, all that cyclical opening and closing over distension. This patient on conventional mode is not recruitable. I'll just continue. When we did uh, from 8 to 14, on the right of your screen, you see that orange, That's that means over distension. So we were, we were able to get a little bit more distribution to the dorsal area with the higher peeps. However, with the orange that you can see over here, signifying over distension and a loss of compliance in that area, it wasn't an option to use that higher peep because it would have put in danger the ventral area of the lung to over distension. So here's just the full screen image that you can use when you're outside of the room. It's bigger, you can see it from far. And um, yeah, you still see the left dorsal area. So we put the patient on APRV in an attempt to open up the lung. We had some uh, modest settings. The PHI was uh, set at 20. We had uh, an initial T high, I believe, at four seconds, we're using the auto release option. And this is what the tomography looks with the APRV. And as you can see, that left dorsal region has completely opened up. Here's an image of uh, the next day. So we see that the APRV was able to correct the left dorsal region. There was less over distension seen on um, the ventral areas. Here's another example. So this isn't two studies. It's just that you can only get five frames. You have to press these arrows to toggle back. But if you look up here, we're dealing with PI of 20 up to 30. 
A, B, and C are actually a P high of 20. So you see over time, look how unstable the dorsal region and mid dorsal, like look at all that yellow. This is a really unstable lung with a P high of 20. We can see the vectors, this yellow, and we're actually not even increasing PEEP in these three ones. Just over time, as time goes by and that collateral ventilation occurring, we're starting to have less and less instability of the lung until we hit D, which is 22. We start increasing that P high, and then you see that upward trajectory in increasing in compliance. And look at that the lung becomes significantly more stable. Again, we're using customized analysis. So we're looking at compliance loss as orange and compliance win as blue. This is E. And then we go to F up to H, which is 26, 28, and 30. So we see here the blue representing win and gain in compliance through this area. We see it also with the vectors. And notice here, as we increase that upward recruitment of your functional residual capacity. Here's an image also. Now, when you start increasing the PHI, you're going to often see a very large intensity, but you got to keep that belt on for your shift. Sometimes it's just, you have to get through this phase where the intensity is high, where likely the alveoli are, are dealing with a little bit more stress, a little bit more tidal volume, but you got to allow that collateral ventilation. You got to allow those slow recruitable compartments. And then over time, if you're patient, you might have a better distribution of ventilation. So we're going to check out after an hour or so, I believe, what the distribution then looks like. Over here, don't mind here, these circles are the diaphragm being captured. What we're seeing here is a good increase in distribution all throughout the lung at the end of expiration. We're looking at the impedance values. You remember that we multiply the impedance values by the reference tidal volume. And here's the global amount, which is 900, a little under a liter. And here is the ventral to dorsal. So we managed with a PI from 20 to 30 to increase 137 mLs in this area over here, making the lung much more stable. We see this is why it's less yellow. There's less instability because of all of this increased volume, basically almost a liter. That's what removes that instability. So if we're patient, we have 30 minutes into it. But two hours into it, look, we went through this recruitment phase and now we have a much more homogeneous distribution of ventilation. We don't have that lung here on the right side dealing with more of the stress, more of the tidal volumes. We don't have this area that is atelectic, that's kind of pulling the adjacent alveoli and over distending them on expiration. We're not getting that atelectic trauma. So this whole problematic region going through the recruitment phase, and now with our patients, we end up getting a very, very homogeneous distribution of ventilation. This is a lady from OptiFlow comparing 10 to 16. It's a trach patient that was on OptiFlow going back on pressure support, and we are trying to wean them. Over here, you see A is the OptiFlow, and right up to a PEEP of 16, you see this area, we're not able to open it. This blue here, this gain is just these little amounts that we're able to increase. So what do we do? We decided that we went to a rate right up to a peep of 20. So 16 didn't work. We went up to a peep of 20. This is where we are at a peep of 20. This is over here, G. So you see, if we go from all of these peep, nothing really is happening. But when we get to H and then we continue, so this is I to M. So this is 22 right up to 30. Now we're getting somewhere. Now we're starting to get an increased distribution of ventilation. See, this is opening up. You're gaining compliance through this area and it's improving. If we look at K, L, and M, this is actually the P high at 30. So over time, now you're seeing. 83, 100, and then 139. So again, over time, 
the compliance is improving on this patient. So we wanted to get the patient when they were resting on the ventilator, completely recruited, breathing on the CPAP level, still using their diaphragm in, in a more natural way so that we could be optimized and rested when we did the OptiFlow. And we were actually able to get this patient off when we were using APRV. Here's just some images, the distribution, OptiFlow versus the p high at 30, just some more, because don't forget these are dynamic images and I'm scrolling around the time axis because it changes between breaths. Over here, this is a, just so the this video This is a option. patient that is we're on OptiFlow. We're trying to wean the patient off of the ventilator. So we're going to put the patient back on the ventilator. Now that we have the reference with the OptiFlow, and we're going to find the parameters on conventional mode, and we'll try APRV also and see which one recovers all of the, the lung recruitment so that the patient, when they're uh, going back on the vent, they're properly rest, rested and optimized for the next um, the next OptiFlow trial. So we did a PEEP study on pressure support right up to 20. Uh, we were unsuccessful in improving anything on the left side. We transitioned into APRV and we then we then started with a P-high of 20 and we gradually increased it by two and we're looking at the end of inspiration to see if we have improved uh, recovery. This goes over here. This was when they were on OptiFlow. Kind of look, look at here. I'm scrolling. So this is at a P high of 30. So it's, we're going to recruit. So we see that the lung that was pri previously closed over here has opened up with APRV. So when we look at traditional modes versus APRV, the optimal PEEP does not mean complete alveolar recruitment. It just means that this is the best you will get on that specific mode. With APRV, because of our control of time, it may have better recruitment. And I suggest using the Palma Vista 500. I think it's a technology that down the road is going to be like gold standard. I live in Canada and in the United States, in two, three years, I believe, the Palma Vista from Draeger will become available. It's just waiting for FDA approval. That's it. That's the end of the presentation. Thank you for listening to this long, long presentation, and I hope you enjoyed it.